left. Okay, we'll try to cover as much ground as we can. We've lost a good portion of time. Okay, we're going to start on chapter 10, verse 5. It says about the first of the last three plagues, locusts, the first first plague that's mentioned in this week's parsha, which is locusts. They're going to cover the face of the earth, and you're not going to be able to see the earth. You're going to eat whatever was left over from when the bara, the hail, destroyed a lot of the plants, etc. So whatever's left over, the locusts are going to eat. And they're going to eat all the trees that grow in the field. So the Chomat Anoch wants to know, who are we talking about when they say they're not going to see the uh, the ground? Who's not going to be able to see the ground? The Egyptians aren't going to be able to see it? The they, right? It just, it just says they. It doesn't say the ground will be invisible. It doesn't say the locals will cover the ground and no one will be able to see it. And they won't be able to see the ground. Who's they? So the Chomat Anoch, and I have the source here, but very briefly, uh, he gives an uh, he gives he brings an opinion that there's going to be so many locusts that each locust will cover up the ground to the point that the locusts themselves won't be able to see what they're eating. The food will be invisible to them. All right. So what's the big deal? Who cares if they can see their food? Ah, because it says in the Gemara, a very important rule in life. If you can't see your food, you're not going to be as satisfied as you would be if you did see your food. You're going to keep eating and eating and eating. And that's what happened with the locusts. The locusts covered up the ground. So even the locusts themselves couldn't see what they were eating. There were other locusts blocking their view. And so they couldn't ever be filled up. So they kept eating and eating. That's how uh, that's how um, unsatisfied they were from uh, from what they couldn't see. So that's uh, that's an interesting uh, observation. Uh, how it relates to us practically is very important. By the way, the, uh, the, the, it is important to see your food for a number of reasons. But one of them is because you're uh, you're you're not you're a lot of uh, bad eating habits occur from pe from people who can't see their food. Uh, I, I'm not trying to destroy the uh, the movie theater industry, or maybe I am, but uh, the uh, the idea of eating your popcorn in the dark, uh, you, you ever notice, uh, it's, it's sometimes you, you eat an entire bucket of popcorn, let's say it's, uh, assuming it's kosher popcorn, and, uh, and, and nevertheless, because you didn't really see your food, you were watching, you know, the, the important uh, story going on on the screen in front of you. So therefore, you, uh, you, you, you aren't as satisfied as you would be. It's an important rule in the Gemara and uh, one of the important rules about food. And it, it, it's interesting how it applies to our pasuk. All right, so let's, uh, let's keep going. We have in the next uh, pasuk that we're going to learn, we're going to have two opinions about kind of different things, as you will see. But... Um, the this this uh this lengthy what we have in front of us here is several psukim, chapter ten verse seven through eleven seven eleven, uh, no slurpy here though, and uh, we're going to talk about um, an interesting conversation that happened with Moshe, and one of the things one of the famous commentaries on this pasuk is one of the how do you say this like classics of Jewish uh, commentary. In fact, twice today, God willing, we'll have certain classics, certain like uh, like essential learn. If if you had if you had a book of essential Torah comment comments, the Kli Yakar on this pasuk and the Ramban at the end of the of the parsha are probably going to be in that book. So that's that that's how essential some of these comments are. So uh, let, I'm going to try to read this real quick and translate. So uh, Paro tells Moshe he's not interested. Go away. We're not leaving, letting the people go. Uh, then the servants of Paro said to him, "Is Amri love? He said, 
don't why is this going to be a trap to us just let these people go let them serve their god otherwise mitzrayim is doomed the yushav at at moshe of aaron they brought back moshe and aaron of paro back to paro and and uh and and he said to them oh worship your god then he says the very weird words me va me ha cholkim who and who is going? Not just who's going. Who and who's who in the world would be going? It's a double language. It's a, it's, it, it emphasizes something. Who who would who would you take with you? Says Moshe. We are Moshe, bin Arenu, with our children, Vizkenenu, and with our old people, Melech, Vivanenu, Vnotenu. We're gonna go. Uh, uh, young and old, we're going to take our sons, we're going to take our daughters, uh, we're going to take our sheep, we're going to take our flocks. It's a, it's a holiday to Hashem that we're going to go celebrate, and we're going to take everything with us, even our animals. So, uh, so he responds, uh, um, I, I, I already told you your children can go. That's fine. Take your kids. But you, obviously, there's something bad about what you're doing. So he said, "The you, only you men should go worship. You're, you're going to go bring sacrifices. Who bring sacrifices?" Not your children, not your daughters, not your old people. You're the young men, go serve your God, bring your sacrifices. So, uh, so that that's what you want to do. And they uh, and, and they're like, no. Uh, he said, everybody has to come. And then they were kicked out from for Paro. So first, let's start with the Malbim. The Malbim wants to know why does Paro ask who and who is coming? So says the Malbim. He says you have to understand who or Paro or the Paro's perspective. That's a good uh it's good alliteration there. Paro's perspective. Uh Paro's perspective is possibly uh peculiar. And what, it, what Paro is saying is that in his understanding of religion. That's what you really have to get into. You have to get into the heads of the people talking. Paro believed that there are, okay, there's there's a God. But what's God's job? What does God do? So this is very important because we often get mixed up with other people's philosophies when we think about God. God doesn't have a good side and a bad side. Everything God does is good. And there's no opposing evil influence in the world that God is 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 against. There isn't a, an antichrist or a Satan who is the opposite of God trying to make problems. Uh, that's one of the uh, that's that's the belief even of uh, Zoroastrianism. Uh, many other religions believe that, that kind of ancient idea of the the, the 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 two warring gods, the good God versus the bad God, right? That's not Jewish philosophy. That's how Paro understood it. And when he said, Mi va mi hochim, what he meant was, your people, who are they going to go worship? The good God to gain blessing? Or are they going to go worship the bad God to keep it, you know, keep the good, bad God happy and then he won't bother you? Who is going and for what? Mi va mi you're going for which me for which god are you going to be going for and if it's just for either one of these gods of course are we going to be worshiped if worship differently in some way right the good god for instance would be it doesn't want blood it doesn't want slaughter doesn't want death of any sort everything is his creation why would he want death and the good the bad god is the other way around he's, he's bloodthirsty he's waiting for for death and pain 
So when he asked who is going, which God are you going to go worship? So if it's the good God, then you then these these women and children, they, that makes sense that they would come. But don't bring the livestock, don't bring the animals, because you're not going to be sacrificing them. Because the good God doesn't want sacrifices. Ah, but if you're going to go for the bad God, then bring the animals, but don't bring the women and children. They don't need to see this. It's a whole misunderstanding of what it is that we worship. We don't worship, we don't try to appease the gods, right? We're not, uh, you know, we're, we're not uh, trying to uh, avoid a famine, so we're chopping off the heads of, uh, of warring uh, clans, like like the Mayans or something. That, that, that's not what we're doing here, right? We're, we're not uh, we're, we're not trying to have a better yam harvest, like in, uh, in, in you know ancient Africa or something. That's not what we're doing when we worship God. We're what we're doing is we're connecting closer to Him. That's what a, the idea of a korban comes from. The korban, the root of the word korban, is karev, karov, like like Kiru, it brings closer. We're trying to attach ourselves to God. We're saying these things that you gave us, we're giving it back to you. That's what a sacrifice means. And that's why it's not always animal, right? That's why we have the mincha sacrifice with grains and such, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that's the Malbim. The Malbim is, uh, is, his whole point is, the reason that Paro said this is because in essence, he wants to know which uh, which which god it is that we're going to be worshiping, and if it's any one of the two gods that he envisioned, then obviously we don't need everybody that Moshe is naming. So that's the Malbim or Hashem. That's uh, that's what we have here. Uh, so we we have the so so we have the whole source here and in, in the source sheet that I was hiding from you. Okay, so the, the next comment is from the Kliyakar. The Kliyakar is amazing, mind-blowing, earth-shattering, paradigm-changing, right here, okay? Some of you already know this, so you're big experts, but what Moshe was saying in his response, we're bringing the men, we're bringing the women, we're bringing the sons and daughters, we're bringing young people, old people, we're bringing the animals. What he's saying is very, very important. He's saying, in Judaism, Everybody worships. The family worships together. In other religions also, can we have to understand what other religions are like. In other religions, one member of the family, <laughs> to be religious, okay, uh, you know, mom is going to pray for us. You know, your, your older brother is the, the priest, whatever, he's going to pray. You know, in, uh, you know I, I remember learning about uh, the, in England uh, before the... Um, in the, like Victorian England, it was pretty standard for uh, for somebody who had a number of sons for that person to send the first son off to university to become some sort of priest, because they expected one member of the family to be the religious leader for the family. Now this, in a way, mirrors something that that was the plan in Judaism as well, where the bechor, the firstborn, was supposed to be. Uh, the person who would bring the korbanot and, and uh, be dedicated to to the Beit Hamikdash, and that was taken away uh, from from the Jewish people during the uh, the problem with the golden calf, which we'll get to in a few parshiot. Meanwhile, though, uh, the idea that Kliyakar says here is the whole point. All of so na'renu, kenenu, uvenenu, v'latenu, nelech. Key, it's it's a chag lano. It's, it's our holiday from Hashem. Meaning what? Meaning it's everybody's, the whole family's holiday. It's not just one person goes and does whatever the person does, and everybody else just kind of doesn't, you know, it, it, it take, takes a nap. That's not how Judaism is supposed to work. Now the father of the family goes to shul. Everybody else sleeps in bed. Now, everybody's supposed to go to shul. If they're not in shul, then they should daven at home. And if they're not davening at home, they should be preparing for the meal or something. Everybody's supposed to be dressed for Shabbat. Everybody's supposed to be growing and becoming more spiritual on Shabbat. It's not just a day to sleep. 
Sorry, I'm going off on a rant here a little bit. But th but that's the idea. It's a holiday for, uh, for, for the Jewish people, for all the Jewish people. Uh, we still have not really dealt with too much uh, an issue that keeps um, that keeps sort of circling around, and that is the issue of wasn't this kind of a lie that they were going to go to the desert for three days and worship Hashem there? But uh, th there's a, a number of answers to that. Hopefully, we'll get to that in, in a, next year. I'm not really prepared to speak about it right now, but it is an interesting question. It's uh, if you if you've had the question. Uh, it's it's not a bad question. Okay, um, on, on on this verse, it's very interesting with the regard to the Malbim versus the Kliyakar. Uh, one way you can look at it to try to help uh, help you remember it is that the Malbim deals with whom are we worshiping? What is what is this God that we worship? And the Kliyakar deals more with who worships? Who's what kind of a family do we have? What does our God want from uh, from from our family's behavior? Um, next piece. Um, so, in warning the uh, in warning the uh, the Egyptians about the plague of the death of the firstborn, Moshe says, "Where Moshe ko amar Hashem." Moshe says to the Egyptians that God said that around midnight I'm going to come to be within the Egyptians and that's when I'm going to kill the firstborn. And Rashi asks right away, in case you didn't pick up on the question already, Rashi says, what's, uh, what's with like, like around midnight? So it's because it says Rashi's Mashma Samukho, it's close to it, close to midnight. Olafanov Olaf either a little bit before, a little bit after, around midnight. Uh, this is when it's gonna happen. Why? Shema Yetau it's Tagnine Paro Yamar Moshe Badaihu. So the Gemara in Brachot uh in uh on at the very beginning, back in the beginning of Brachot 4a, very beginning of Shas, really the whole beginning of the, the Talmud. There's a discussion about this pasuk, and what what the uh, one of the opinions is is that if Moshe says it's going to be around midnight and it happens at some other time at midnight, you might think, ah, Moshe's a liar. Right. All of your firstborn are dead. Okay, all of them, the firstborn animals, the firstborns you didn't know were firstborns because uh, of your immor immoral behavior. Uh, every single firstborn is dead. And you're going to say, Moshe's a liar because it happened at 1201, really. It, didn't, it happened at 1159. It's not really midnight. No, come on. What's going on? What, what's happening here? So... Um, the Khatam Sofa writes, I'm sorry, I don't have the source here. It, Safari does not have the Khatam Sofa yet, unfortunately. Let's see if I can find it. Here. Yeah, yeah. So the Khatam Sofa writes, first of all, there's a number of answers to why the, uh, the stargazers might say this. First of all, it, it's, a, it's an Psychologically, it's just a way to relieve your your own stress, you know. Oh, it's not because of uh, it's just a coincidence. First of all, they didn't have it wasn't they didn't have the internet, so they didn't know that every firstborn is dead. Maybe uh, maybe there's a plague. Maybe something's going on. Maybe they had uh, COVID uh, negative nineteen, whatever. Right? So it was a uh, you know whatever it was. Nobody knew what 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 it was that that was causing this to happen. So that's first of all worth mentioning. The, the the uh, Rav Hirsch says an interesting answer. Also, quick quick answer just, just to be just to introduce the Khatam Sofer. So the Rav Hirsch says it's because the, the 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 Egyptians just had the plague of of darkness. They missed a few days. 
They're discombobulated. They have no idea what time it is, where they are, who they are. They're all very confused. And of course, they might get the, uh, the timing wrong. Okay? Says the Khatam Sofer, though. What time zone are we talking about when it's going to be midnight? So it's going to be midnight in Eretz Yisrael, because that's the only time that Hashem would be talking about. Hashem cares about Eretz Yisrael. His eye is always on Yerushalayim. So the time in Israel is the time. It's like what we do when we, when we say that the Molot is for the month, we say what the Molot is in Israel. So if the time uh, is uh, when, when it will be in Israel, therefore, the Egyptians will have will be slightly off because we're not going by the clock time. In other words, the twelve-hour day. We're going by uh, by by halachic time, which has to do with uh, with what time sunrise and sunset is, or something like that. We're not going to get into that whole uh, machloket about uh, how to calculate a day. That's uh, actually in the Daf Yomi lately, um, in the beginning of the uh, fifth parak of Pesachim. Okay, anyway, so uh, Rabbi Yohanan, uh, Yohanan Ibchutz gives another answer. He says, also based on the Gemara, also in Brachot earlier, even one page earlier, the Gemara in Brachot uh, 3a says that one of the signs for when midnight is, because remember, they didn't have alarm clocks. How do you know when midnight is? And you want to get up, let's say you want to say Tikkun Chatzot and pray for the destruction of Yerushalayim. And uh, whatever. So how do you know when midnight is? It's because that's when dogs are barking. Okay, so when dogs are barking, that's when you know it's midnight. And the wolves are howling, whatever you want to say. Very nice. Only problem is one small problem. We'll get to it later. But the Pasuk tells us that the Bnei Yisrael, when they were leaving Egypt, which is at the middle of the night, pretty much that's when they started, the dogs did not bark. The miracle happened. The dogs didn't bark. Therefore, uh, the Bnei Yisrael, uh, when they left, it was not a good time to judge time based on dogs barking because dogs weren't barking. All right, so that's uh, that's another answer to why they um, to why that would happen. Okay, next uh, next pasuk. Okay, we are. Um, this is fascinating. This is really fascinating here. We get into the mitzvot. The Jewish people are, begin to be commanded mitzvot. In fact, if you're following along in, uh, if you want to know, uh, if you want to study the mitzvot of the 613 mitzvot, at least according to the Rambam's opinion, there is a book that follows the entire Torah from Bereshit all the way to the end. And it goes and it lists every single mitzvah and gives, and gives commentary on that. It's an ancient book now. It's called Sefer HaChinuch. It's written rather anonymously. There are opinions about who wrote it, but it was, for all intents and purposes, it was anonymous. And the Sefer HaChinuch has a listing of all the mitzvot. By the way, it's a very difficult, uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's difficult to keep track sometimes because some parshiot have a lot more mitzvot than others. We, Rabbi Hollanders mentioned that in, in previous previous classes, uh, so I'm sure most of you already know that. In all of Sefer Bereshit that we finished, in all, the entire book, you know how many mitzvot there are? Three. Three mitzvot in all of Bereshit. And then, all of a sudden, we get to this part, we didn't have any mitzvot between, between that and now. And the very, very, this Parsha, Parsha Bo, has 19 mitzvot, bam, like zero, 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 19. Right? It's, a, it's a very strange graph to draw, but uh, uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's not easy to, to keep up with the Parsha sometimes if you're going to try to do it with the, the Sefer HaChinuch. Uh, you, you, you might have uh, already uh, given up because like there hasn't been any mitzvah for a while, so maybe there's nothing else to learn. So uh, the mitzvot that, are, that occur Begin with the mitzvah, the mitzvah of the very first mitzvah the Jewish people are given is to count the months, right? We have a mitzvah, we're supposed to count the month, we're supposed to announce the molad, 
or there's a there's a whole process of how to say when when there's a rosh chodesh. That's the first mitzvah the Jewish people are given. There's a, there's a lot of reasons for that. We're not going to get into that now. Then we're giving we're given a whole scoop of mitzvot all about Pesach, about chametz, about maror, about matzah, about uh, the, the the mitzvah of uh, of, of the, the 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 Pesach sacrifice, which is uh, which is very complicated, and each one of the rules of the the korban Pesach has its own mitzvah, according to the Rambam. Now, uh, before we get into all that, uh, there's just an interesting uh, little Beit Halevi I'd like to share with you. So as we talk about the, the mitzvot of the Korban Pesach, it says, et balayla. you have to eat the meat on that night. Balayla has that. You're, you're supposed to even finish it before chatzot, before the midnight. Uh, tli Eish it has to be roasted. We know that. That's one of the reasons we have the custom not to eat roasted meat because we don't want it to look like we're trying, like we're trying to say that we're eating the korban, the sacrifice. Matzot al marori milchlu. We're supposed to eat it with matzah and maror. Remember the famous Hillel sandwich. He uh, he learned from this pasuk that you have to eat them all at once. Really, uh, you're supposed to take a bite. Of the matzah and the maror and the Pesach sacrifice all at once. Now you're probably wondering, hey, that's not the, that doesn't look like the Hillel sandwich that I've been eating. And you're right, because the Hillel sandwich you've been eating was missing the meat, because we don't bring the korban right now, unfortunately. Maybe this year we will. Maybe Mashiach will come, God willing, and then we'll uh, we'll have a uh, a complete Pesach um, as we ought to. The Beit Halevi has another question. Completely other question. The Midrash tells us that the night of Pesach, the night of Pesach is the same night every year that the Pesach starts, it's the same night that Tisha B'Av starts. So if Pesach starts, I'm not really sure. I think it's uh, the Erev Shabbat, uh, Motzi Shabbat this year. I think it might be. So then Tisha B'Av this year will also be Motzi Shabbat. That's how it works. The Midrash points this out, and the Bet Halevi wants to know why. What's the connection? Why is the Midrash telling us this? Is it just, just, for, our, you know, just for our amusement? Uh, whenever A happens on B, that means that C will happen on B. No, that's it doesn't seem like something the Midrash would uh, waste its time on. He says, What's the, What difference does it make to us what day of the week Tisha B'Av is going to be? He says, there's a very important kavanah here. There's a very important intention that the rabbis had in telling us this. And that is, we know that we left Egypt early. We left Egypt not because we deserved it so much. The Midrash tells us, the Zohar tells us also, we were on a very, very low spiritual level. It's called the 49th level of Tuma, whatever that means, right? The, the Jewish people in general, I should say, on this 49th level of Tuma. And when Hashem took us out, it was because if he would have waited any longer, we would have fallen all the way through. And once you get below the 49th level of Tuma, you're done for. You can't. You can't improve, whatever that means. The Beit HaLevi says, since we left Egypt early, without having fixed all of the characteristics that we needed to fix, that's what, that's what was supposed to happen in Egypt. Egypt was our cauldron that built us up into the nation that we were supposed to be. Had we stayed in Egypt long enough, had it not been for the problem of we had to be pulled out or else, if we would have stayed in Egypt a little bit longer, we would have been fully formed, and we wouldn't have made the mistakes that caused the Tisha B'Av. In other words, it's our leaving Egypt that has a connection with Tisha B'Av. 
We left Egypt too early. We weren't ready. And because we weren't ready, that's where the Jewish people sinned and didn't have the confidence in Hashem and sinned with the spies. And that spiraled into this terrible holiday called Tisha B'Av, the ninth of Av. And therefore, we need these current exiles that we're in to unify us, to make, to strengthen us, to make us into who we should have been to begin with. We're going to skip the next piece, the Meshachachma. It's a beautiful piece, but uh, I've already uh, recorded my video for this uh, this week's Shabbat Drasha. And I've already used that there. So, so to, to keep things original, let's get let's get, get right into the mitzvah. Let's talk about this one of the mitzvot that's in this week's parsha. Let's see it in the eyes from the eyes of the Sefer Hachinuch. Okay, here we go. The mitzvah is uh, on, on chapter twelve, verse forty-six. A lot of uh, verses in chapter twelve. All of them are almost all of them are connected to the mitzvot of the of the uh, Pesach offering. But by Dechad Yechel, you have to eat them in one house. In other words, you can't eat some of it in uh, in Bob's house, and then, sorry if uh, your name is Bob, <laughs> and then you can't eat the other half. You know, uh, we, we had a nice time here. Let's go next door to, uh, to Joe's house. Sorry if your name is Joe. And uh, let's go next door to Joe's house and finish eating it there. And it's not a problem. We, 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 you, you can gather together. It's not a pandemic issue. You can gather together to eat this Korban Pesach uh, when we had it, of course. We just couldn't eat it in more than one house. You had to eat it in the same place from beginning to end. Okay? So the question then becomes, why? What's wrong with eating it a little bit here, a little bit there? What's going on? So let's look at the Sefer Achinuch, if we may, and we may. And again, I told you that uh, the uh, from Mitzvah 4 to, I think, 23 are all uh, Mitzvot in this week's Parsha. So Mitzvah 15 is Shalom Lohotzi Mibbasar HaPesach Futa. The prohibition to remove the meat of the Korban Pesach outside. Because you have to eat it indoors, you have to eat it in the house. As the, sorry, as the Pasuk continues, it should be eaten in one house. You can't take any of the meat outside. You and, and you can't break a bone in it. Now, all of these are separate mitzvot. So the question is, why can't we eat it? Uh, outside. Why does it have to be eaten, eaten indoors? So, that's by telling us this mitzvah, and then he said, Misharshe mitzvah, the root of this mitzvah, the reason for this mitzvah, right, that's here. Um, what we have written above with regard to the slaughter of the Pesach offering back in Mitzvah 5, he said uh, about the, that there's a Mitzvah that you have to make the Pesach offering. This is supposed to remind you of the miracles of Egypt. That's the general purpose of all of the Pesach offering Mitzvah. However, Adonim because on this holiday, we became lords. We became masters. We became in charge. We became the big bosses. Therefore, Baha Mitzvah Allah, this mitzvah comes, that you should be eaten in the same place that, this, that the group started eating in. And don't take it outside. Because what, what does it mean when you, when you, take, when you take your food outside? Means you're not confident in your spot. You need to move around. You're maybe on the run or something. You have to. No, a king doesn't eat like that. A boss doesn't eat like that, right? You eat in the comfort of your home. You sit up. You lay down. Whatever. You 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 you, you sit in your recliner. You pick your feet up and you eat, and nothing moves you. You don't move. 
That's how a, that's how a master of the house should eat, you know. That's not the case if you're going to move around. If you move around from one place to the other, it's not how it's not dignified. And there's a certain amount of dignity that the mitzvot of Pesach are supposed to teach us. Next source, next uh, topic, one of the last mitzvot in the Parsha, pretty much one of the last mitzvot, is the mitzvah of tefillin. <laughs> mitzvah of tefillin. And um, the Pasuk tells us, ot al yadcha, zikrun bein enecha. It should be a sign on your hand. And it should be some sort of uh, reminder um, between your eyes. Doesn't mean literally between your eyes. You're not supposed to have to fill in there. Bein inecha means somewhere uh, above your eyes. Although it says bein, which usually means between. Lamanti Torah Hashem beticha, so that the Torah of Hashem will be in your mouth. Ki biyar chazaka hutsiyach Hashem mimitzrayim, because Hashem took you out of Egypt with a strong hand. So we ha we're given the mitzvah of tefillin. Now, a lot of mitzvot are given to us uh, in regards to Pesach, and we, we, uh, we're we going to talk a little bit more about that when we get to the famous Ramban, like I said, one of the classics uh, of, of commentary in the Parsha. Um, we'll get to that soon enough, God willing. Um, assuming the technology holds up. But right now, I'd like to share with you some ideas from the Maharal about what tefillin is. We, we have a, a, a huge misunderstanding if we think it's just some sort of adornment. You know, the, the uh, Catholics have the rosaries, uh, the, uh, the Muslims have their beads, and we have phylacteries. That's a fancy word for tefillin. That's, that's not what tefillin is. Tefillin isn't just a, a, a nice little uh, um, thing we wear. Okay, so let's talk about from a deeper source what some of these things are. The first I'd like to quote from the Netzach Israel. Uh, uh, the the Maral wrote several different books on different topics. Uh, this is from Netzach Israel. We're going to also have, have a quote. God willing, I don't have the source here, but also from um, Gvura Tashem, another one of his books, and also from his commentary on a Galita in Talmud called. So let's start with the Netzach Yisrael. So Netzach Yisrael, he says that mankind is called an Eitz HaSadeh. Which means a tree of the field. Now this is a good time to remind everybody that Tu B'Shvat is coming up and we have three, count them, three events, three tree events coming up in honor of Tu, of, of tu B'Shvat. Uh, this Sunday, we have uh, a Zoom event that uh, we're participating in together with uh, JNF. And then uh, next, uh, the following Wednesday, we have uh, my Revitin is going to be teaching how to how she makes her root soup. And at this, uh, right after that, we'll have the Parsha class. So that's going to be 6.15 next Wednesday, followed by uh, the next Sunday, we're going to have a quick socially distanced easy hike along the San Diego River to look at some of the natural uh, plants and vegetation here in our beautiful little town of San Diego. Uh, that's uh, that's going to be at 10, 15 in the morning, the following Sunday, not this Sunday. If you show up there this Sunday, you're on your own. Uh, you won't have Marilyn Stern to, to lead the pack. All right, but a, a man is called an Ish, an Eitzha Sunday, tree of the field. When why why is that? Rakshu Ilan Hafuk. We're only a tree in the field in terms of us being actually an inverted tree. What is an inverted tree? How does a tree grow? A tree has roots on the bottom, and then it grows and grows and becomes more physical as it gets on top. Right? And then the fruits come out from the top. The human being. The exact opposite. 
our shorish, our root is limala, is up above. And our fruits are, in other words, our more physical things are on the bottom, are, in, are on, the, on the earth. So we're, a, we're, we're an upside down tree. What does this have to do with tefillin? This planting that we have, the way that we're planted by Hashem, shows us that our real connection is up, or it's up above, is, uh, is, is Hashem. So he says that tefillin is a bodily commandment that makes the body, the physical part of the human being, holier. Interesting thing, by the way, you know, uh, a lot of people know that there's a halacha that when you're wearing tefillin, you're not supposed to go into the bathroom. If somebody wants to ask Reb Moshe, well, what if I cover it up? I'll cover up the tefillin, yeah? I'll put a, a bag over it or a napkin, and I'll go into the bathroom. Is that, is, there's no problem with that, right? Right? Wrong. Says Reb Moshe, it's not the tefillin that are holy. It's your body that's become holy when you put on tefillin. So when you're going into the bathroom with your tefillin on, it's you're you're desecrating this holy thing called your body. It should not be in the bathroom with tefillin on. Nothing wrong with going to the bathroom, by the way. Don't get me wrong. But your body has become sanctified with tefillin. And there's certain things you can and cannot do when you're uh, when, when you're in, in a more sanctified state, for lack of a better word. So that's what he says in uh, in Netzach Yisrael. I couldn't find this uh, the source in uh, in Sepharia fast enough to put it in here, so I don't have it here. But in uh, Gvurat Hashem, eight fifty one B, if you're curious, talks about the heart of man, which is the source of the life force, which is where, where, we get, where we get our chiyud from, our, our our life, and then our brain is where we have our seichel, our intelligence. Right? And that makes sense. That's that's basic, you know, physiology. Right? We, our, our 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 heart uh, pumps. Yeah, our heart pumps blood. To, that's what gives us our physical abilities to move. Our brain. You don't have to move in order to use your brain, right? And you can do a lot of things with your brain with, while you're not moving. Right? You can you can lay in bed and have your eyes closed and you're not moving your body at all, and your brain could be working nonstop thinking of things, you're inventing things, you, ha you have uh, questions to ask the rabbi, all of that is mental, right? And does not require physicality at all. As the, says the Maral, in the same way, we have parts of Judaism that are also physical and spiritual like that, having to do with 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 uh, life force and having to do with intelligence, and those are the temple, the Beit Hamikdash, and the Torah. Right? Those the world needs those things to exist. Why? Because Torah is the intellectual. Right? So there's a whole argument in the in, in the Mishnah and the Gemara whether uh, whether learning is as, as important as doing a mitzvah. Right? The Holy Temple is a place of avodah, of work, of doing. You can't just go in there and close your eyes and think, or even open your eyes and think. You'll be, you'll be hopefully inspired, et cetera, et cetera. But it's a place for you for, to do. You have to bring a korban. You have to bring in the dava, uh, your, your sacrifices, your promises. That's how... That's how the brain and the seicho are connected or should be connected. And when we put on tefillin, the point is we're sanctifying those things. We're saying our, our, our action, remember the tefillin of the arm are pointed towards the heart. Our actions, our physical body is for Hashem. Our mind, our sichus, our seicho is for Hashem. Our moach is for Hashem. We're dedicating these things to him because he has a plan for us. And that's the uh, that's the moral there. There's a lot more to say on this topic, but I really wanted to spend some time on this 
like I said, classic, fundamental Ramban. It's, in fact, uh, a few years ago, a few years ago, two years ago to be uh, precise, Rabbi Hollander went out of town and, I, and he asked me to take over. And one of the things I did in one of the evenings between Mincha and Marif, where we had to learn, so the thing I decided to learn was this Ramban. I brought this Ramban from Pashat Bo. Very important Ramban. Also about the fillin. It happens to be it's, uh, it's commenting on the pasuk in uh, in, in the uh, about the fillin that has to do uh, I guess chapter thirteen verse sixteen that says um, that says Vayal od al yarchal to the fourteen and keep because again but Yana Hashem b'Mitzrayim. And so it shall be a sign upon your hand, a symbol upon your, your forehead, uh, with, that with a mighty hand, Hashem took us out of Egypt. Same, same pasuk that we uh, dealt with before. So, 13, 16. Asks the Ramban a question. Totafo, in Necha. Has to be a totafa. Has to be a uh, sort of decoration. Is that all it is? You're just decorating your body? Mascara, tefillin, it's all really the same thing. So long, long Ramban. Some beautiful ideas here. Some Kabbalistic. Goes into great depth about what the Totafot are. So, he connects the totafot to a totefet, which are which were decorations that women would wear as a sort of ornament. Then he says the underlying idea of this mitzvah. He says, "Let's go. Let's try to find the spot." Uh, so shorish mitzvah has has a, the real reason for this mitzvah is because we we have in our tefillin. A written record, a document testifying to the exodus of Egypt, and we're putting it in, on our arm and on our head, opposite the heart and the brain, like the Maral said. Because according to Ramban, both of them, the heart and the mind, are, are the seat of thought. That's where thought really comes from. And of course, we know this because uh, we, we've heard this idea before. Obviously, the, the heart doesn't do any thinking. It's just a muscle that pumps blood. But you don't show somebody, when you tell someone, when, when you want to draw a picture back in elementary school to somebody uh, you, you were in love with or whatever, right? You didn't draw a picture of a brain, right? You draw a picture of a heart. Oh, how cute. A heart means love. What do you mean love? No, it doesn't. It's just a, a muscle pumping blood. It has nothing to do with love. Ah, but it does. Because your heart feels things. And your heart can drop out of your chest if, you, if you've been hurt by somebody you love. Right? You, it, the, 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 heart, the heart thinks. It's part of where you, your thoughts come from. Your heart pushes you towards the, the direction of certain things. Sometimes good, sometimes bad. Right? The eyes see what the heart wants, right? That's how it works. Um, but he concludes the Ramban, the end of his thing, very beautifully. He, he really has a question, and it's, 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 it's a fascinating question, worthy of our time, in the little time that we have left today. The Ramban wants to know, why is it that tefillin, and a lot of other mitzvot, by the way, tefillin and uh, Shabbat, a lot of other things, are zeichel etziat mitzrayim, to remember the exodus from Egypt. Uh, tefillin, remember Egypt? I put on tefillin in the morning, I'm supposed to think about the exodus from Egypt. What's, what's the connection? So he says that Hashem doesn't do open miracles for us anymore. He did for our forefathers, and our forefathers passed it down from child to child to child to child, all the way down to us, that we were rescued by Hashem and were taken out of Egypt. Since those miracles don't happen anymore, 
We need to remember the miracles that did happen in the past. And then that's good to give that connection to Hashem. Why did Hashem create miracles for us? It wasn't by accident. As Shlomo Volbe, Zeich Tzarek Levracha writes in Ali Shor, a person And this is important. I start off by saying that there's a Gemara in uh, in Shabbat that says all the gates of Gan Eden are open to somebody who answers a man with all of his might, not a woman, a man. And the the reason for that says the Gemara, or says Rav Volbe, wants to know what the reason is for that. He says it's because says the Gemara, it's an acronym, I mean, it's an acronym for Kel Melech Neman. God is the trustworthy king. So this creates this imuna in Hashem. Hashem is, uh, is, is, uh, is not just a piece of nature, but beyond nature. God does things for us that are miraculous and have nothing to do with just, oh, that's something that, the, you know, the uh, the, the sea split that was because of the wind or whatever. That's not how this works. The fact is Hashem does things for us because he loves us. He gives us nature, it's true, but when we say amen, when we, when we show Hashem how much we care for him, we believe in him, what we're saying is we recognize the fact that indeed Hashem set up this nature and Hashem can break nature for us. Right now, when we're davening for somebody's before Shalema, like Yisrael, Ben, Rivka, we're saying, yeah, the naturally speaking, yeah, he should be sick. It happens. You catch a cold, you, you, uh, you, you take this medicine or whatever happens, happens. But Hashem, you can break that. You created that nature, you can break that nature. And that's what we, that, that's why we went to Tefillin. Tefillin is a sign it's an unusual sign. And we're using nature. We're using the skin of an animal and everything else. And what we're saying with that sign is, you gave this to us. You're telling us what to do with it. We're going to break nature. We're going to become something holier. And that's uh, th that's the message of the Parsha. That's why we were freed from Egypt, in order to become holier, greater people. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop the recording now and stop the live stream to Facebook.